the topics I plan to get through this evening. Um, all about some, uh, some backdated Australian sales because the 2015 numbers have now been uh, officially released. It's coming up for June, so that's how long it takes to do all the verification and so on. So I've got that for you. We're then going to talk about the EV standards and the connectors. This was a request for Merrick to try and get the group up to date with the, with the plethora of different connecting systems worldwide and uh, I'll be able to give you some uh, good information on that one. Um, I've just come back from working with Mitsubishi uh, EV engineers in Japan last week. Um, got an enormous amount of stuff out of that which I'll be able to share some of that with you this evening and also ESS, Energy Storing Storage Systems because uh, that's now becoming very top of mind certainly in, in Japan and Europe. Um, but very strong in Europe and of course as you know rolling out in Australia as well. Um, I'm then going to talk about the Outlander, um, current model, new model and the new 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 models. Uh, so I've been through all the engineering stuff with the guys and um, I'm pleased to say that our company has been commissioned by Mitsubishi to in fact uh, work with them on the 2017-2018 cars uh, in terms of some of the features and benefits and the human interface side of the vehicle. Uh, it's a great opportunity, so I'm pretty proud of that one. I'll give you an update on iMeve. iMeve is not dead, uh, so I'll give you an update on that one. Um, I then, uh, about three, four months ago, I presented a document on uh, the Outlander plug-in hybrid electric vehicle performance um, as per the vehicles that we've got in our fleet. Um, and uh, I've got more update information on that uh, which will uh, tweak you a little bit and make you sit up straight when we get to that, get to that stuff. Um, and then there's some new products and services. So um, it's quite an agenda, but uh, feel free to, uh, to ask questions as we go along, because as you can see, the topics are changing quite considerably uh, from, from right to left as we go through the process. Okay, first up, and I hope you can see the numbers, I sort of made it as big as I could, these are the 2015 sales of, of uh, battery electric vehicles and uh, does this come off Eric? Yep. Um, and hybrid electric vehicles uh, in Australia. This is only cars that are registered on the road. It is not cars in, in park, car parks and on grass at dealers. This is actual registrations and you'll notice it does not include Tesla because Tesla won't release that information globally and we're in the same situation in Australia. But there's a few things, a few cars there that you may not be aware. Uh, I was quite surprised to see there was 60 A3s from Audi. Um, in BMW we know those, those cars. Um, there's, these, these are the uh, petrol electrics. We've got all these new categories now. Electric diesel, electric petrol, petrol electric, battery electric. So it's, it's the, the uh, marketplace is now broken up so you can actually drill down and see exactly what's going on. But I think, um, look at the Lexus, they're, they're doing quite well. 1144 of the 600H, uh, of the, what's that one, the 300H. Um, so Lexus has actually got 3,200 cars in the car park um, as, of, as of December uh, 2015. Uh, Mercedes, not to be outdone, they've got 10 cars. Uh, Nissan, this might surprise you, 313 Nissan Pathfinder hybrids. Um, uh, quite an amazing number uh, for a car that you probably weren't aware is actually in the Australian marketplace. I must admit when I went under that number, the majority of purchases are in the eastern seaboard. It is a hybrid car, it is not plug-in hybrid, it, it is a hybrid car. Um, and Porsche, uh, done quite well at 43. Of course, you would expect Toyota to be the king of the, uh, of the group. And Prius C uh, is 1,200, um, the, f the 5 is 640, and the traditional is 459. Looks like Prius has come over the top and starting to... In fact, uh, we didn't have one Prius driver in the, in the audience tonight. Uh, and that's got to be uh, pretty close to a first. Um, further vehicles, these are the diesel electrics on the road in Australia. Um, um, 223 in the category, Range Rover, um, 
the uh, Range Rover Sport car, that's the vehicle built out of the Outlander, not the Outlander, the uh, Freelander. Um, then in Benz we've got their, got their group, which is quite strong and growing quite quickly. Um, in the petrol, uh, electric petrol hybrids, 1100 vehicles, uh, BMW sitting there of course with, with its cars, range extender, notice the range extender is, is vastly, uh, uh, vastly well, going well, uh, the i8 was only a few of those, um, and we get down to uh, Outlander 753 um, and the Tarlan Charlies at the bottom. So that gives you a bit of an idea and be aware when you're following a pathfinder, uh, look at the badging because it might be one of those hybrid uh, pathfinders. 313 sold last year. They're looking to double that sale of that particular category, by the way. So there, there's going to be some action in the marketplace on that. Okay, moving on to um, more of a technical topic. We're going to talk about the EV standards and connectors, both AC and DC combinations. And guys, there is a huge amount of change in this part of the industry. We might have to park China uh, because that's a, another set of standards which so far hasn't come out of China. It's still only applicable within uh, continental China. Uh, however, that will start to roll down through Asia, I'm sure, before 2017 as, the, as their influence starts to happen in the marketplace. So... The connectors. The connectors are, is the bit that goes, it's that white handled or grey handled part that actually plugs into the car. That's what we call the connector. And there is a heap of different ones. The EV connectors focus particularly on the emerging electric vehicle market, what's happening both at infrastructure levels, where the infrastructure guys, that is the guys like our company that, that works on um, charge stations and integration of charge, charging solutions. Uh, we have input into that into that configuration, and certainly uh, manufacturing companies in addition for both long term OE and aftermarket. So um, there's been quite a few combinations, and I think it'll be a bit of an eye opener. Multiple connector uh, designs globally uh, that is a, a presents an issue, uh, obviously, especially when uh, the small world we now live in because of transportation as we start shifting cars around between continents then we start to find out the irregularities in the vehicles and the issues. Uh, as I said China has a unique design and of course Tesla has its unique design. And we haven't got any Tesla drivers here tonight? Yeah, good, right. So those are, those are, those are, uh, are unique categories but we'll dwell a bit on those as well. There's a lot of misinformation um, about the Tesla uh, connector. So just to recap, the charging modes, uh, we talk about um, the, the, the mode 1, 2 and 3. Mode 1 is in vehicle, 2 is in vehicle and the third one is, is actually street charging stations. So the charge stations that our company uh, distributes throughout Australia are actually a mode 3 enabled charging station which has got a, a lot of other features and benefits over, uh, over home charging or cable and cord charging that might have come with your vehicle. Um, and you can see some of the current uh, values there. Maximum of 16 or 3.7, um, maximum of 7.4, and these ones go uh, from 63 to 14.5 kilowatts, which is quite a, quite a different uh, uh, machine altogether. And in regard to the standards, there's two predominant, uh, what we call level two standards, in AC charging, uh, and then there's a standard, there's two categories in the DC, or direct current charging. But in the AC charging, we've got the JSAE, it's an American design, J1772, Type 1, and this is the Menekes design from Germany. Um, those are the two very pivotal types of standards that are being used in, for electric vehicle connectivity. In addition to that, we have the Chinese versions, um, called a GT slash B version, and we've got the Tesla ones as well. So um, there's actually four different types that are recognised um, as being a standard. Um, and uh, so type one is generally the adopted standard in Japan, the US, and Europe. 
this one was adopted by the European charger makers. They decided it's a German design, a Menekes. Um, quite a strong and a good product. Uh, and it's got capability of having three phase, whereas the, uh, the 1772 is a two phase, or one phase or two phase, but the um, uh, Menekes is a three phase, and it can also be DC or AC. So uh, that's, a, that's a significant difference in, in its design. Um, now available where the, uh, the contact gender has been changed to bring the standard for vehicles in line with the International Electric Elect Electrical Commission, uh, which is the European governing body. So there's been quite a, a lot of work done uh, by the Germans in getting that particular standard up and running. And in Australia, you'll see both of those versions. Um, well, I haven't seen much Menekes. Uh, there's two BMW i3s that have got it that I'm aware of because BMW's talked to me about it. How do they convert them back to SAE 1772? Uh, so there's two there and in Perth, West Australia, uh, the Ford, uh, the Ford, uh, not Fusion, the Focus um, engineered cars that they built are all Menekes as well because West Australia decided Menekes was the better standard of the two. So in, already in Australia you've got a need in Western Australia to have Menekes and SAE 1772 alongside each other. Uh, whereas Eastern Seaboard, there's no, there's no Menekes. Um, having said that, uh, the people that have been in the industry for a while would remember a company called Better Place. And Better Place was a Menekes system. And you didn't know it because they hid it. And you, you were either supplied with an adapter cable or the Menekes system was hardwired back to SAE 1772 at the charging position. Um, so, but obviously better, better place is no longer around. Um, this is just a, a quick snapshot of uh, types of cars that use the 1772 standard. Um, this is the female. Oh, in the Menekees you can have both female and male versions. So you can have a female socket or a male socket a female plug or a male plug, just to add complexity into it, which means it doesn't connect. If you've got a female socket and you've got a, a female plug, it ain't going to work. So you know, there's, that's another tier of, of level uh, that we have to face in the industry. But you can see predominantly the 1772 is certainly uh, uh, most popular. Citroen C0 is, is just a Mitsubishi I need rebadged and the Peugeot Eon is an iMove rebadged. Um, and, and we've got the Smith uh, Edison van, which is a, a little bit like a Renault rebadged jobby, uh, an American build, uh, but it is a proper light commercial vehicle. Um, and there's Prius plug-in, which of course we don't have in this country. Um, Vauxhall Ampera, um, Holden Volt, Chevy Volt, are all the same car, of course. So um, one female and, and the type 2 is male um, and both mode 3. So uh, smart car, which of course is Mercedes, um, they tend to uh, have a combination. What you buy off the showroom today is not necessarily what you're going to get tomorrow. So it's a bit of a, bit of a mixed bag, although we don't have those cars in Australia. So just by way of recapping, there it is, the white handle one here that I've uh, brought in. Um, that's the 1772 female plug. Uh, so the male socket, uh, oop, uh, the male socket is in the car, and the female is the plug. Um, now, I actually, like, from an engineering point of view, I actually like having the females in the plug because it means that the there is no way that you can see pins, and there's no way that you could tamper or touch or or fiddle around with a pin. They're not active anyway. We all know that. But it's a point of deterrent, if you like. Oh, I can't see the pin, but can't touch anything with a multimeter. Well, you can, but you can't, if you know what I mean. It's a bit harder um, with the female version. Um, um, uh, uh, 10,000 mating cycles is the standard for both Menekes and uh, SAE 1772. So it's 10,000 cycles in. Out. And there's machines that just do that all day until they get failure. And the biggest failure we get actually is with um, with the charge point systems, uh, particularly in uh, Eastern Seaboard and the, and the Burnside Village and a few locations around Adelaide, where people won't wait for the 
authorization process because they have to authorize for charge point units um, and they try and yank the handle out of the bracket and of course it, it breaks the uh, breaks the locking latch up here and that's a non-service part so our company's actually got the job to go out and change cables and, and connectors for, uh, for our competitor <laughs> because of that particular weakness. Um, other people insist on trying to drive away which you can't so what do they do? They release the release handbrakes and stuff and try and push the car to, and it's still connected, you know, bang, off goes another one. So, um, yeah, a bit of an issue. Um, looking at the connector specifications, you'll see if you just glance down the various columns, the only significant difference is in the cable sizing um, uh, on the Menikees Type 2 uh, compared to, to all the other specs. It's very, very similar. Um, uh, the, the rate of current 1632 and 70 so that that handle is designed to carry 70 amps uh, if necessary um, read super uh, read um, Tesla and uh, down here it's, it, this one goes to 63 uh, however from a uh, impedance point of view and ele electrical design point of view I actually like the the Manikis one over the SAE but there you are that's the, the way they've designed it so they're very, very similar uh, devices. Uh, this is the male socket. Um, so you've got a female plug. This is the male socket. And I just wanted to show you, you can actually see the pins. Um, this is a, a four, uh, four, um, uh, four fixing point plug uh, socket. Um, and um, we often um, get uh, questions uh, that have come our way by, from Mitsubishi who might say, uh, I bought this year Model 10, uh, I can't charge it at my charge point location or um, whatever. Um, I'm been told you can fix it. Well, what we, what we the first thing I say is open up the flap, have a look and count how many pins you can see because you can actually see them. And usually it's the control pilot signal one is missing and uh, that's because uh, that was the way the iMode was built uh, at that time in Japan. And we got what we got in Australia. So there's 110 cars out there. Uh, our company has now converted 64 of them back to the correct standards so they can now be charged in the street uh, or with home charges and so on. So that's, uh, that's the male soccer. Um, this is the Manikis male plug. Interesting, so we've got, we've got the male plug or female plug available. Um, uh, what can I point out? The same thing, 10,000 mating cycles. That's the standard, guys. So you're getting a good product either way in terms of its uh, longevity and durability. Uh, that's the female plug. So that one was the male plug. That's the female. Doesn't look much different except, of course, um, the, the, uh, the, the, you can see there the, the, uh, the pins are not visible at all. And you can see there, there is, there's the pins on the male version. So if you're going to buy a car that's got a Menikee set up in it, um, be aware. Uh, just have a look at what the configuration is because it, chances are it may not be adaptable to Australian uh, charging stations. Uh, interesting, we're just having discussions today with Adelaide City Council on this very matter because uh, we're looking to roll out some charging stations and they'd like to use the, uh, the Tesla supercharger station for other cars and we're pointing out the differences. Um, this is the Menikees 4 position locator uh, female socket and if you need any of this equipment we can supply that. There's a couple of guys in the association have purchased the sockets to, uh, for your home conversion cars so that you can then be um, uh, adaptable on the street. Um, then we go on to the DC uh, um, co uh, connectors. Um, this is the one that you'd be familiar with uh, down at Mitsubishi at the uh, Tonsley. They're still free to the public. 24 hour access, pull in, charge up, 28 minutes later, off you go, 80% state of charge. 80% delivered against your uh, startup um, state of charge. If you want to, if you've got time, you can shut off at the 80% level, uh, just press the button uh, to um, touch screen, and restart it again, it'll then go up to 98%, uh, but it'll take a lot longer to do it because we can't pump. 364 volts DC and 128 amps into a into your battery pack and expect it to survive um, for, for 
with the heat issues that are generated. So um, the protocol internationally is 80%. If you hear different figures to that, it's nonsense because that is, that is the charging protocol. And it's the same with the uh, combination charge system from the um, uh, from, uh, US as well. Um, and th uh, there is the differences. This is the, uh, the Chardamo. Um, Chardamo is uh, charge de moteur. What it means is uh, I can drive electrically for distance, basically um, a very, very rough French interpretation there. Um, but it also means that the, um, the standard is set by TEPCO, that's Tokyo Electric Power Company. That's where it came from. As you remember, TEPCO was the company that had the, uh, had the uh, issue with the um, tsunami uh, to get their uh, nuclear power station. So um, this is th there's the DC positive, DC negative, DC positive, DC negative. But notice up here, it's a derivative of the SAE 1772. So we go back to the AC accepted standard in Europe and uh, Japan, America as being part of that combination handle. Um, these, there's pins in each one of these slots. This is all the communication, the CAN, CAN positive, CAN negative, uh, proximity, control pilot signal, all of that communication happens in these, uh, in these little pins in here. And similarly, those two there, uh, that's a, a grounding wire. In Australia, that would be active and neutral, or line one, line two in Yankee speak or European. So they're two different devices, and they're not interchangeable. Um, this is the connector pin layout um, uh, for the for the um, uh, Chardamo, uh design, um, and you can see there's control of the EV relays. There's a couple of relays that have to have to happen. Uh, this is the positive and negative. Sorry about the colour; it's just washed out with the projector there. There's your CAN communication positive, CAN neg, and uh, and more control relays. So every one of those cables, every one of those pins have to, has to be operational uh, to make that device work. The reason is that it's got a lot of safety engineering because it's designed to transfer 364 volts and 128 amps. And it's designed to do that, you get 50% charge in 12 minutes and then for, the, for a, uh, another 30% is as it tapers off and tiles away to allow the battery pack to cool down. Um, some cars uh, react to this. Uh, Nissan Leaf, for example, is uh, a high, uh, high voltage battery pack, is air cooled. And um, in certain countries like Arizona, Nevada, um, and Western Australia, you get a lot of uh, ground temperature heat rise as the car pulls up over it. And it actually shuts the charging down until the car is stabilised and the battery pack is stabilised. Uh, whereas the Outlander and the IMEV, uh, um, Outlander is a combination, but IMEV is a, is a water cooled with a bit of glycol in it and you hear the pump pumping it around. Uh, so it keeps it cool. So it can, uh, it can accept quite an aggressive charge in a very short period of time. Um, gosh, okay, circuitry. Um, uh, this, this is the, uh, the, the connector, that's the, the plug in there. Um, this is the car side. Uh, and this sort of circuitry in here is what we uh, replicate and duplicate uh, when we make up these little uh, connectors for uh, converting the 1772 back to 3-pin, but current modulated 3-pin for use in charging wheelchairs, gophers, electric scooters, electric motorbikes, etc. So that one interfaces with the other handle, SAE 1772. Um, Here's some examples of some of the actual connectors out here uh, in the industry. There, there's the Menekes, there it is. That's the original standard from Germany. Um, we call it the, uh, uh, the vanilla one. That was the first of the, uh, of the most adaptable standards. And you can see you can have uh, L1, L2, so you can have three, three phase if necessary. Uh, there's a neutral, there's a common ground, and when it's converted to uh, DC, we use pin 1 and the neutral. Uh, those become positive and negatives. Um, proximity. Proximity is a word that simply means if you're charging your car and you get into your car and you try to turn on the car, the system will identify that you're wanting to move and it's going to shut the system down. 
Um, so that's what that does, the, the proximity. It's a very important one, actually. Um, it also checks that the latching is latched and the cable is in firm, uh, so it's part of that cycle. And the control, oh, and the control pilot signal, uh, which is that one there, that's the communicator backwards and forwards to turn on the relays in the car to at the various steps of progression. And if you've been, um, if you've had the ability to put instrumentation on your charging station, you'll see it starts off at uh, 0.3 of an amp. It then goes to 3.8 amps, jumps to 5 amps, to 7 amps, and slowly works its way up. That's the control pilot signal testing the car for isolation. It's a technical term in electrical industry to making sure that the car is actually grounded because it's sitting on four rubber tyres. So if there's a fault inside the electrical charging system, that's the fellow that picks it up and shuts the system down. It's very fickle and it's a point of frustration to us guys that are trying to engineer in the field um, versatility because um, it's the one that picks up irregularities in surge or battery capacity or battery overheating um, and sometimes it's not always correct. Um, there, there's type 2 and uh, it, it, it's just showing you the, the positive and the negative uh, terminals there. Now that's a, a Tesla variant of the Menekes. So the Tesla is not actually Menekes, it's a Menekes clone if you like. Uh, that's one of the many variants in Tesla. And here's more variants. That one there has got a, a, a star section inside. I think that's S, that one. This one's got a, an embossing up and a depression down, which means it's got to have plastic slugs draw, uh, going in to orient it correctly. But it still looks like Manakees. Um, this one is a, a Manakees converter to SA1772. That's just uh, off-the-shelf product from Tesla, so you can you can buy that one to to uh, do it. This is the genuine vanilla um, uh, Menekes in the ZE, the Renault ZE, and there's another view there of that star-shaped one. Um, so you can see the confusion that's out there in regard to connectivity. So um, where are the DC charges made in North America? Um, and I guess you can see Nissan is the biggest producer of DC fast chargers and their entry point is 20 kilowatts and they go up to 170 kilowatts um, for their commercial range of vehicles in 200 for example. Uh, ABB from, uh, from Germany is a big producer now in America and you get all the other brands. Blink used to be Ecotality, that uh, company went uh, bankrupt and it was purchased by others and it's come back into the form of Blink. Um, a face it, uh, Air Environment, that's the company we represent, uh, Eaton. Eaton you made a fantastic product about six years ago. Um, they then uh, de-engineered it. That was, it was just superb. It was way over the top from an engineering and design point of view. And that made the price about um, a US dollar, $60,000. And of course it was uh, outside of the market at the time when everyone else was $40,000. Um, they've redesigned it. Bosch is a clone. Bosch don't make it. They just pick up another brand and, uh, and rebadge it. Um, BTC and uh, Ad Energy. Now uh, that's, um, uh, that's a French one. So those are some, some of the manufacturers that are producing DC fast chargers. Um, the ones that our company installed in Australia are no longer made. That's the Acre Wade one from, uh, from Virginia. Uh, it's no longer manufactured. Uh, they're at one of the casualties of the early adopters, I'm afraid to say. Um, all of these ones are, uh, yep, all of those are switch mode now um, technology instead of uh, using big copper transformers and analog controlled uh, data managed analogs. Uh, they're all switch mode and of course tritium in Australia is now producing and actually starting to sell into the US market. This has a radiator and a fan, it's water cooled. Um, it has a high frequency hiss that we've got a problem with blokes like me with hearing aids. Probably yarn will pick it up as well. It's um, a bit of an issue, that one. Um, okay, uh, moving into a new topic. Um, because I spent a, um, a week in Japan with the uh, EV engineers, associated with the EV engineering is um, another division of Mitsubishi um, called Mitsubishi Electric. And we spent a day with uh, Mitsubishi Electric going through 
their smart house and smart systems. And um, it was quite interesting to see. This is, this is the actual uh, house that we, uh, oop, that we went through. Uh, um, and uh, a typical Japanese style home, um, typical for any of the major cities. Um, you see a lot of these. I mean, uh, Tokyo is a city of 24 million people now. That's the population of Australia, of one city. And they're, they're all this two-storey style uh, echo living uh, of the new generation uh, of houses. The earthquakes have told, have just taught the Japanese quite a bit how to do that. And uh, from the back view, we've got a carport here. Oh, that's actually the front of it, and this is the, uh, the, the decking area. Uh, sorry? Yeah, they're brick. They're a, um, they're a bit like the herbalite, uh, herbal form bricks that we have here. You can cut up with a saw. Yeah, yeah. Everything's lightweight echo, beautifully done, um, and designed for high winds, earthquake, and to roll with the roll with the slab. Yeah. No more of bricks and mortar like we understand. Um, this is uh, it's called the Home Energy Management System, and I think I've, I, look, this was a whole day's work. Uh, but I was more interested, of course, in the EV componentry of it. But I couldn't help but be impressed with what they've, do, what they've come up with. They designed the house from the beginning as a smart house. Um, so the, the word power conditioner, we would call that inverter and controller in Australia because it's obviously taking solar inputs from the roof. Um, that's wired. But all the rest of this is all wireless um, for the ventilation systems. It has a... PLC, Programmable Logic Controller, um, which is this device down here, um, and this put this piece to interface, and it identifies as you're walking through the house, the air conditioning comes up, goes down, senses your body heat, sets the temperature to what you want, sets the lighting to the moods that you like, and all that sort of stuff. And there's a fair, probably a week's programming when you buy your house to get it, you know, to get all the data in there. Um, but it recognises male to female, it recognises body stature, body mass, and it starts to identify what energy consumptions you might need to keep hot or keep cool, you know, whichever way it is. Um, very, very impressive. So that's called Home Energy Management System. Um, uh, induction heating is popular there now. Uh, every room has TVs and so on. Um, so what does the controller do? It, it has that visualising function. Uh, it looks at who's come into the house. It says, oh, I don't know that mass, that BM, we call it a BMI index in Australia. I don't recognise that mass. Uh, that must be a visitor. Uh, so I'll go into the visitor setting for the home, uh, which might be cooler or, or warmer or whatever you want to do, whatever you've, you've set it up for. Um, it then looks at uh, power limitation. Um, you'll notice that... Um, You'll notice there's a Leaf and a Mitsubishi there. This is on Mitsubishi property. And whilst I was in Japan, I was, I was very fortunate to be a guest at the, uh, at the naming of the new merged company. Because if you don't know, Nissan now have purchased the major shareholding with Mitsubishi. And as a consequence, the uh, Nissan, Renault, Mitsubishi alliance is now the third largest automotive company in the world. So we've got Toyota, Volkswagen, Mitsubishi. Um, so uh, seeing leafs in their property was, was quite common and seeing the engineering interchange. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So um, uh, power, uh, power limitation. What, what they, the way the, this ESS system works, and here it is graphically shown, here's your house with your appliances, here's your voltaic system, here's your controller, and here's, they call it a power conditioner, but it's actually an inverter with a lot of smarts added into it. What you don't see there is a battery pack. The philosophy in Japan, you don't need a battery pack. You've already got it. It's called a car. It's got a wheel on each corner. Plug it in. So the car actually is the mobile battery pack. So and where we're going down the path of having independent power walls and other branded products that are using uh, off-grid batteries to power your house, the Japanese-European philosophy is now turned, no, you've already purchased uh, a thirty thousand dollar battery. Why don't you use that one instead of buying another one? And the the it's good it's good thinking. The limitation function identifies how much energy is in the cars. You can have two or three or four cars. How much energy is in the car? How much do you want 
for your startup or launch of your of your family or your day on the next working day? Do you want it 100% charged or 80% charged or 60% charged? Because you're only going to do 20 kilometres, so why overcharge it? Feed it into your house and run the property. And that's, what, that's very much what happened. And it was quite fascinating watching this controller, uh, the screen in the lounge room. So if, if your wife goes out at night, then you're in the dark. You've got the grid. Oh. Yeah, you've got the grid. I haven't, what, what is missing off that, thank you, is the grid connection. There is a grid oh, yeah, connection. Yeah. Because if this is full, this is full, the consumption is low, but then you can sell it back. That's what this box does. You can then sell it back to the grid. They have the same system as us. Uh, they don't get anywhere near what we get. We get about 52 cents a uh, kilowatt hour. They get about, um, I don't know, 6 yen, I think it is, you know, 2 and 6 months, something like that. Yeah. Um, so th they're a system, as you can see, all the appliances, everything is designed to run off the car. The car feeds the house first because you've already told the, the system when you want to use the car next. Okay, So it makes sure that it's, that it's got sufficient energy for where you do it. So it cooperates with the PV, EV and the home. Um, with the fine weather, the power generated by the photovoltaic was supplied to the home appliance. And when it's still too much, it then goes back into the car as stored energy. If it then gets too much, then it, or, then it exports. Uh, with rainy weather, the power to home the appliance was supplied from EV battery. And if necessary, consumption control will be sent from the HM, HEMS control to the home appliance. And of course, you can do all this from your mobile smartphone. You don't have to be home to do it. Um, so the house is warm, the house is woken up, the, you know, the, the fridge is on, the kettle is on, you walk in and there's your dinner and there's your microwave already cooked. Okay, well, uh, any questions on that? Because I'm going to move right away from ESS. By the way, I'm a supporter of Australian type ESS, that is um, a, a battery bank, and this one building you know, my own, for my own use, for the 8 kilowatt. Under this system, no. The HEM, the HEMS runs the whole thing. It's it's an external management system. But you know, as I said, everything hum, runs off the car first. So that not from the grid, from the car. So you're not actually charging the car from the grid first. You're charging. You're using the the, the car as the buffer, mm. and you pull it down. You might say, oh no, I may, we, they pull it down to 10%. That's the, that's the threshold. Then the, then the grid has to come back online, run the house and recharge the car again. I was the fellow that had to stand up in front of the engineers and say bullshit. I don't know the Japanese for bullshit, but uh, but uh, he was because I was saying I'm seeing an 80% duty cycle in in cycling the battery. What's the life of what's your anticipated life of that battery pack in the IMEF? They use IMEF because it's a, a good sized pack. Um, and he said eight years. And I said my car, our IMEF, is still 92% in six years. So he's probably right. And so degradation of the cells. Remember, it's different chemistry to Outlander. Uh, the degradation of those cells is, is yeah. Lithium ion phosphate loves it. I'm, I've come back convinced. Lithium ion cobalt manganese oxide, which is Outlander, does, doesn't quite like as high cycles. Yeah. So Huh? Yeah, the, the car is the battery. And when you think of the capacity in the car, see, my home is, uh, it cost me about eight to nine kilowatt hours and 24 hours of consumption. Well, of course, the iMove is a you know, 16 kilowatt battery, and you can use 80% um, uh, of it quite comfortably. Yeah. Doesn't it mean the battery is available Yeah. Correct, correct. And that was my argument for the Australian understanding of ESS, where we're out doing our work and earning our money, we want the sun to be charging our, our home. There was no external, there was no internal storage, it's all external in the car. So 
Yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Outlander. I had the good fortune to be able to go um, for a whole day on Outlander uh, manufacturing um, and with their engineers and um, heaps of questions. I, I sent over 24 pretty high-tech questions uh, before getting there because the Japanese like to understand the questions that are coming at them and get their answers ready. Um, but essentially, uh, these are the, the high-end bullet points that came out of the, the various meetings. Uh, current production is 60,000 uh, cars a year. Um, it's gone up from 42,000 to 60,000. And it, uh, in their view, uh, they're six months behind global demand. They just can't meet global demand. And so it's looking like another line probably will have to go in. Um, it's been an outstandingly successful vehicle for, for Mitsubishi. Um, the 2016 car is going to use the same battery capacity. Um, it'll be exactly the same as we've got today, 12 kilowatt. The same charging port for Australia in, in 2016, so it, which will means just one 1772. Uh, the same range. And the work I've been doing in Australia that I guess got me the Guernsey to spend the time with the guys, is, there's a few of these uh, articles that was published on some uh, performance work that, that, uh, we'd, that my company had been doing. And where uh, the majority of Outlander, uh, you can get around 48 kilometres of electric only travel distance uh, by doing, uh, changing the charging stations and doing what we call intelligent current modulation, we're able to get the vehicle up to 87 kilometres. Uh, that's um, you know, just about double uh, the, uh, the stated range of the vehicle electrically. Um, their engineers were wrapped, they didn't believe it, we went through it and they said, okay, we've got some, uh, a good opportunity here to uh, remarket this vehicle. Um, but it only works with the charging station that we've done the um, work with. Uh, and the good thing is, we can charge the Outlander in 149 minutes, from zip to maximum. And uh, when you compare that with the Mitsubishi uh, charge cables, uh, between five and seven hours, that's a hell of a saving. Uh, it's got knock-on for ecology, of course, um, and, and, um, and greenhouse gases, etc. Um, but the good thing is it applies the vehicle now to, uh, and there's an there's image off the dashboard showing 87 kilometres. Um, it applies now, that, it means now that we can go to the public, or particularly in Australia, to councils, to major fleet users that use the vehicle and want to turn it over fast, and we can give them a... Uh, an underpinning 87 kilometres of travel distance in 149 minutes. So two and a half hours, uh, you're, you're from zip to full. And, uh, and that's really having a fantastic effect uh, to the point where uh, one, of our, one of Mitsubishi's customers in Australia um, has just purchased 45 uh, plug-in hybrid electrics. Another one, 32. It's just because of this, it's starting to really blossom and roll out into the industry. Um, Haven't touched the car, Terry. Haven't touched the car. We've just understood the chemistry. We've understood the algorithms. We've understood the needs. Look, it's state of health, state of charge, state of fitness, cell temperature, cell balance. You've got five major signals that have to come together to, and then the charging station that we have uh, has what we call a current modulated <coughs> intelligent algorithm. So it picks all the high points and works out what's got to be done. And that little ripply graph on the back um, is the end result, and um, there it is, it delivers. So, um, councils like Alexandrina, which is Gore, uh, we've got two of their, two cars in there and two charge stations. Victor Harbour have now said, okay, we better, we better have a couple of cars. We've got two cars going into, oh, Mount Barker, that's finished, got the order tonight for the charging stations for there. Strathalbyn, Meadows, it's starting to, it's at last starting to happen. And Kangaroo Island, two FEVs, um, as well, so it's taken a while. Um, so this is the 2016 car I'm talking about here. The battery chemistry is lithium ion cobalt manganese oxide, uh, not lithium ion phosphate, that's lithium ion, I-O-N, not I-R-O-N. And the 2016 model has a few nice little things. Uh, 
Uh, they've redone the, the launch mapping, that is the acceleration from rest. Uh, redone that to, uh, to lift its um, acceleration speed uh, to knock off 1.4 seconds uh, in, the, in the 0 to, um, 0 to 60. Fantastic effort. Uh, that's good engineering. Same product, same box, same everything, tweaking. Right? Just like we did on the outside, they did on the inside. And the human accessories, I went there, they said, oh, we want you to tell us what Australia would like to have on the back of their uh, Outlander. And I said, okay, well, we, we're, we're, we're beverage-loving people, <laughs> beer. <laughs> so we want a fridge, uh, we want a coffee maker for the, uh, the non-alcohols or the non-soft drink drinkers. Uh, the wives will want hair dryers and the 16-year-old wants his uh, iPhone charged and his, um, and his laptop uh, charged. By the time I got there, they had a car set up for me. <laughs> Onboard inverter. Now, in Japan, there's two voltages. There's 100, 110 volts and 200 volts. They set it up for the 200 volts, but of course, we're 230, so I've got to do some retraining and inverter design. But the concept, they had it all lined up in the back of the Outlander. Would you like your coffee, Mr. Gelsan? Want your coffee to us? Oh, and you want to get cool here? Oh, it was magic stuff. They loved it. They loved it. So you like, you buy, yeah, yeah, we'll buy. So that's the 2016 K. You can expect some, um, there's two or three uh, mock-ups, mock-ups here on the road in Adelaide at the moment. I've been doing some work on one of them. Uh, launch mapping, oh, different vehicle. They're pretty good anyway. But the idea is to kill the ICE and only let the EV do some work. That's what the concept is. Um, iMove, well, you'd be delighted to know that iMove is still in production. They're still building 6,000 cars a year. I looked at the, I drove the, uh, the ute and the van. That's a miniature experience. Uh, <laughs> and of course you know all about the sedan. Disappointingly, every one of those vehicles uh, had the, um, the uh, control pilot signal pin missing out of the connector. So I showed them, you know, this is the, you can't export. No, it's only home consumption. Okay, so it's not going to go out to the world in those derivatives. But uh, they're, quite, they're quite cute, the, the little utes. The, um, the battery pack in the ute is only a 10 kilowatt. There's just no space. And so we pulled that back a bit. Um, using the same chemistry, which is proven, that's six years, sorry, seven years old now. Lithium iron phosphate, still going well. Um, and it will not be marketed in Australia. One of the major reasons, because there's no one here from Mitsubishi, is, there, but, um, is that it, it just doesn't meet our standards anymore. Uh, it doesn't meet the crash requirement. Um, it would struggle at three and a half stars. Uh, so forget it. Um, it's, it's going to last, the, uh, the, the battery, the cell factory that we went to that makes the cells, uh, Lithium Energy Japan, um, uh, they've, they've got it in there. They showed us their forward numbers. It's in, in production for another two years. Um, and then there's a no, new car coming out, which was, wow, was that exciting. So for all of us iMove drivers, yeah, that's what's happening uh, over there. Lithium Energy Japan, uh, that's the company that manufactures the cells. Uh, they also make cells for other Chinese and Taiwan branded B2 products. Um, so be aware that you could be buying a LEJ cell and you don't know it. Uh, their major client is Mitsubishi Motors and Mitsubishi Electric. Mitsubishi Electric for the house side of it and Mitsubishi Motors for the, uh, for the production car side of it. Um, and um, uh, their principal shareholder is Mitsubishi uh, Motor Corporation, so they're wholly owned uh, in-house. Huge growth capacity. We went into a uh, facility that, uh, that manufactures 1.8 million cells a year and sitting alongside is another brand new, fitted out, untouched, not power not yet turned on, to double that capacity. So they, uh, that gives you an indicator of what's coming down the line. Um, they, they manufacture both uh, lithium iron phosphate and lithium cobalt manganese and they support ESS development. I said before that Mitsubishi's philosophy is the car is your battery pack. But there's other customers that want a battery pack under their own brands. So this company manufactures the cells in lithium, um, lithium uh, iron, iron phosphate for ESS applications. Down, Absolutely, hundred hundred dollars per kilowatt hour is the target. Yeah. What is it 
280. Mm. Mm. I mean, they've got a whole factory sitting idle, huge investment, just waiting for the volume to catch up to it. And there's some things I can tell you about volume. Um, just an update now on, um, uh, that's our company, Jeff, uh, an update on some of the stuff you've seen before. I'll flick through it fairly quickly, but we've uh, now updated quite a bit. Um, I'm making these bold statements. Sounds a bit like a marketer instead of a techo. Um, super quiet electric drive, which it is, as you know, toes to 1500. Our car, our company car, has been to the service station twice in six months. Twice in six months. All documented, all data recorded. Right? And um, superb economy, we're getting 1.1 litres per hundred. And I use it in country and city. So it gets a good mix of urban and country cycles. It has not travelled interstate yet, but I'm expecting about four and a half to five motors. Um, the charging options, a lot of people still don't understand how the uh, plug-in hybrid, in fact, where's the gent? There he is. He wasn't aware that the plug-in hybrid was actually out there already. So, but this car can be charged um, by pressing the charge button on the console, and then it uses the internal combustion engine onboard generator. So you can actually command the amount of charge you want to put in the battery as you're driving along. So you can do that. Uh, or it can be charged by allowing the FEV to automatically charge as its conditions allow. So if you burn off all of the electric capacity and you turn on your EV control meter, you'll see that there's no capacity, there's no kilometres, but the car's been driven electrically. Yes, because the, the uh, petrol motor will come on, runs the generator, the generator charges the battery, the battery supplies the energy to the wheels. Remember, there's no tail shafts, no drive shafts. Everything is electric on that vehicle. So to get power to the wheels, it has to come through um, the electric side. Um, or oh, or uh, by using the provided charge cables, they charge from five to seven hours, depending on state of charge, state of health, temperature, and a whole bunch of other things. That, to me, was unacceptable uh, charging time, particularly when we'd uh, designed the charge stations to get it down to 149 minutes to full charge. Uh, so we then set about taking that that technology from the charge stations and we've at last been able to launch our own um, charging cable, this is a 15 amp version, that will charge uh, the car in 152 minutes and deliver you 61 to 68 kilometres of travel distance. Um, that's not bad from a uh, three, pin, uh, 3 pin plug. So that one's now, uh, I'll show you more about that later. And you can also uh, connect to a level 2 charging station. So. There's, there's the specification we've now built. So the, char the vehicle is very versatile, can be charged in many, many ways. Uh, that's a typical charge station. Uh, that's a pedestal type. That's a that one's from uh, Gore, down at Gore. Alexandrina Council put that twin charge uh, head in. Um, you know, a few features, it's stainless. Uh, that's actually in their car park. Uh, yeah. No, but... But we're, 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 we're using the use of this and councils now said, OK, uh, it's looking like the um, um, information centre, the RSL car park for a public free access. And uh, where's Ted? Yeah, the Bombora development. Uh, it looks like those two are going to get a run. The, the, um, uh, the next one will be the information centre, which will be public domain. Uh, and uh, it will be a single, unfortunately. Oh, um, I've found with councils, if I say next month, I mean next year. Um, so I'm anticipating the last quarter this year. Right. The, all councils have got an issue with supplying a 15 amp um, plug uh, for public because generally it's at about the 1200 wiring rules height um, uh, or higher. Uh, but the problem is it's not safe. You know, kiddies can stick coat hangers in it and stuff like that. So that's why you're not going to see 15 amps rolled out as a, as a free access. It's a real public risk issue. 
Uh, that's a bit of technical specos. Um, you'll see it's a 7.2 kilowatt machine, uh, 40 amp uh, circuit breaker, require a dedicated circuit. Um, this, this product of, that we have now is recommended by all those people there. Um, I also did some work um, to for Mitsubishi because they had a number of um, drivers of FEV that were saying, oh, we're concerned there's no automatic transmission heat exchanger for towing. Um, so we did some work on that and we found that um, the, front, the, the front motor and the generator, they're both on an oil, they have an oil pump and they're both on an oil cooling circuit going out to a heat exchanger out the front. The rear electric motor is on a water circuit, so you've got two different circuits running uh, running in the, um, uh, in the in the in the FEV, and it, it once again is driven by a 48 volt uh, electric water pump, and this is a 48 48 volt um, electric oil pump down here, and this is a, a bypass valve that regulates the oil as it gets up to temperature. Um, I found that on the previous slide, there's the number. Uh, outside ambient of 25, the highest recorded heat exchanger temperature was 44 degrees, towing 1,500 kilos break. Uh, pretty impressive. So it really does work quite well. Yeah. Um, that's the, uh, you can see those little bumps there is what I'm talking about. That's our current modulation. Um, that's a short duration charge, uh, um, 9 minutes, 0.95 uh, kilowatts. Um, and this is a longer one here, 90% in 40, 47 minutes, from state of charge 40% to full charge in 47 minutes. And that's the big fella. And there's the image straight off the dashboard uh, to demonstrate it. When the, when the Mitsubishi Sion engineers saw this, they absolutely went berserk. <laughs> we had seven engineers firing questions and it was impossible for the interpretation to keep up. But in the end, we've got extra business happening as a result. That's good. Uh, this is the overall consumptions data of our company, FEV. Um, the longest EV drive I've been able to drive under normal driving conditions, uh, 71 kilometres. Um, the, the, uh, using the regen paddles, I use between three and five, constantly tweaking the regen to get those sort of numbers. Um, and the maximum recharge distance from the charge station is 87, um, two and a half hours, 90% uh, watt hour capacity increase using a level two charger. The highest energy was 16.25, 3.9 kilowatt. Uh, when the ICE is engaged, we record consumption readings between 1.1 and 1.4 litres per 100 kilometres. Uh, and that's exactly what it's been doing. It's now into its eighth month, still performing the same way. Uh, for those old-fashioned guys like me that have got grey hair and understand miles per gallon, that's 256.8 miles per gallon. <laughs> so it's travelling a fair distance. <laughs> that's uh, imperial, not Yankee miles per gallon either. <laughs> um, and that's a new product. Uh, that's, that's this cable I held up. Um, with, we're delighted about to launch that in Australia. Um, and so there's two versions. There's a, a 10 amp with an inrush of 11.7. 9.8 continuous. All of that depends, of course, on the state of health, state of charge, state of fitness, temperature, age, and cell balancing to deliver that. Uh, and then there's a 15 amp version with an inrush of 16.2. And these, this product, this one here, will deliver 152 minutes from zip to fully charged. Um, that's the member pricing down there. Okay, so. Uh, I think I'd like, just like to perhaps wrap up by saying the opportunity I had both in England, um, I, was, I can't say anything and I've got no graphics uh, about it technically, but um, our company's been commissioned by an English company to develop a completely new concept of drive system for electric vehicles and hybrids, um, so revolutionary that we don't no longer need an inverter um, on board uh, the car, so that gives you a clue as to what it's all about. Um, and we don't need a heap of copper and so on, and um, it's going to be quite uh, quite revolutionary. We had some. I worked at the uh, University of Cambridge in the technical centre with this company, and uh, out of 19 planned tests, we got through 17 of them with outstanding results. And the uh, the big two last ones, which was dynamic force measurements and efficiency uh, calculations, um, we've got some more work to do at the laboratory and 
re do some rebuilding and go back again. So we're getting we're getting close to a global announcement on that one. Um, quite revolutionary. In terms of size, um, uh, 60,000 ton ocean going vessels is one of the targets. Uh, aircraft and obviously motor vehicles uh, and commercial light commercial passenger cars. Uh, that's what I was doing in England and then went straight across to Japan for the um, Mitsubishi experience. I'm not a Mitsubishi employee but obviously I drive their cars and get involved with their engineering people. And there's, not, there's not too many of us that have that privilege. Last questions? I reckon I've done enough. Lance. I reckon if you look in that same spot inside 30 days, you'll miraculously see a level 2 charger appear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Sally and then Terry. Um, so if I heard you correctly, you're looking asking the question about 15 amp plug? Yeah, this is available in 10 amp or 15. And it's plugged 10 amps or plugged 15. Yeah, yeah. The 10 amp one obviously is not the same performance. You can't. Yes, yes. Yeah. Which are actually quite expensive too, by the way. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it's called current curl. It's a problem when you're undersized. Sorry. <laughs> Ten amp one has a ten amp plug, and it's certified, tagged, tested, and approved. Yeah. Okay. Um. What? Yeah. Yeah. Good on you, yeah. And uh, it'll have the Chinese version won't get to Australia. Um, uh, it will be changed to the American or Shuttleworth. Uh, and all the new DC chargers, sorry, the 2017 uh, model Outlander uh, will have both DC and AC. Um, and that'll be the first production uh, DC outside of LEAF and I know. Um, and um, that will have, the charge stations will have combo and DC. Yeah, there's a few BMWs that got combo and Volkswagens, but no. Oh. Yeah. yeah, there's a bit of grumbling about, the, sorry, about the Tesla drivers that use their adapter on free charging. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Terry. Ah, gee, thank you. Um, two, two new cars. Um, now this was uh, announced even in conjunction with the merge announcement whereby Nissan and Mitsubishi, um, you may be not aware but Mitsubishi has been making Nissan cars for four years uh, for, J for Japanese consumption. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, technology interchange between the two organisations. As it turns out, um, on Thursday last week, um, Nissan have got 18 platforms and Mitsubishi have got 18 platforms. Absolute duplicating everything. 36 platforms. So they're going to come together on Friday morning when the announcement was made. They've come together and they're going to have 20 platforms between them. Now the shape on the platform will be different. You know, there'll be a Mitsubishi and a Nissan version. But uh, the, the LEAF that, that we're looking for the third generation, the second generation's done, third generation will probably be, become a Mitsubishi. And that car is called the e, uh, e, EX, and it's a crossover. Um, it's a 45 kilowatt 
battery, lithium ion phosphate again, um, bigger fatter than I mean, outstanding looking styling, just brilliant. Um, and that'll be the leaf platform for future leaf. Uh, however, it travels 420 kilometres on one charge. So that's that's a leap of faith, isn't it? You know, to go while that, while that. So we're right, right in right in Tesla territory uh, with that with that vehicle at about a half the price. Yeah. Twenty eight on. Yes, Tokyo Motor Show. You can see it. It is absolutely in the flesh. It's a, it's a, it's a just superb. And you can, you can tweak it for sports or economy or normal. So if you want to, you can't spin the wheels. The computer won't allow it, but it gets awful close. Uh, there is a um, downsized Outlander on the ASX platform, which is called an RVR in the rest of the world. Uh, so that's going to be upgraded to a pure to a plug-in hybrid. ASX. If we know it, ASX. It'll it'll switch to an RVR. Now that uh, the cars that are disappearing will be X Trail, um, Dwalas, and Koshki. They're they're casualties. Uh, that's what we've been told already. So, engineering-wise, Mitsubishi are ahead of Nissan. Production-wise, Nissan just eats Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi make 1.8 million cars a year. Nissan make uh, 5.6 and Renault 3.8, you know, but they're now the third largest combination in the world with the greatest potential to go fully electric with every vehicle as an option. Yeah. Yes, yeah, some. Because well, I have to say, sir, sorry, but I got a complaint only this morning from a, uh, from um, Adelaide City Council saying it's not manatees. It looks like it, but it's not. Yeah, we have to we have to file off the pinto. Okay. Right. I'll take your comment. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Good. Thank you. Any other comments at all? Well, thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you.